Hello from the historic Delano Hotel, right off, literally right off the ocean here in Miami Beach. This was the first big investment here, this hotel, as they turn this beach area into what you all saw, what we all saw in Miami Vice and all those other TV shows and iconic movies about this place. But that was when this area had investments. That was when this area and this part of our world was a boom town. It has now been two decades, and for too many, the boom has turned into a pure and cataclysmic bust. That is why we're calling our three days in Miami paradise in peril. Because as I said before, obviously, this is not paradise lost. Many people that we've talked to have answers all around these communities, in Miami, around this country. All we have to do is solve the problems with the integrity to identify them first, align our interests to return investment to this country, and get the 30 million jobs that we so desperately need. Florida, of course, also the center of the Republican primary. And the action went like this at last night's debate. Shall we call it Mitt's Revenge? Speaker Gingrich was hired by Freddie Mac to promote them. Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, influence other people throughout Washington, encouraging them to uh, not to dismantle these two entities. I think that was an enormous mistake. Uh, I think instead we, we should have had a whistleblower and not a, a horn tutor. Uh, he should have stood up and said, look, these things are a disaster. This is a crisis. He should have been anxiously telling the American people that these entities were causing a housing bubble that would cause a collapse that we've seen here in Florida and around the country. The governor has cheerfully been attacking me inaccurately, and he knows it. The contracts we released from Freddie Mac said I would do no consulting, wrote in, no, cons I mean, no lobbying, none. But there's a more interesting story. We began digging in after Monday night because, frankly, I'd had about enough of this. We discovered to our shock, Governor Romney owns uh, shares of both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Governor Romney made a million dollars off of selling some of that. Governor Romney owns share and has an investment in Goldman Sachs, which is today foreclosing on Floridians. So maybe Governor Romney, in the spirit of openness, should tell us how much money he's made off of how many households that have been foreclosed by his investments. But let's be clear about that. First of all, my investments are not made by me. My investments for the last 10 years have been in a blind trust, managed by a trustee. Secondly, the investments that they made, we've learned about this as we made our financial disclosure, have been in mutual funds and bonds. I don't own stock in either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. But have you checked your own investments? You also have investments through mutual funds that also invest in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. All right. I was reacting myself. I apologize. We'll get a full reaction across the board, and I cannot wait uh, to hear from our mega panel who has made the trip, Torrey Cristobal and Ari Melber, right here in Miami Beach on the Battle Royale, but right now back to paradise in peril. Florida, of course, a microcosm for what's happening nationwide. 10% unemployment in this state, 16.5% poverty rate in this state, 21% have no health insurance in this state, and talk about the housing bust. This is ground zero. 171,000 pending foreclosures. This state had been or had been the seventh highest foreclosure rate in the nation uh, last year. Driving around, we have seen too many foreclosure signs ourselves, not to mention for those who are not being foreclosed upon. They find themselves deeply underwater. One out of every two homes in Florida, the homeowner owes more then the home is worth. Nothing prevents jobs more than trapping people in a house that they cannot leave to take a new job. We start with Richard Florida, senior editor of The Atlantic and professor at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. And in New York, Umer Hawk, who now wishes, as he sees us here, that he came to Florida. The director of the Havas Media Lab and author of Betterness, Economics for Humans. Uh, there's the book. Richard, I'll start with you. Uh, our premise is Paradise in Peril, not Paradise paradise lost. This is obviously spectacular. Uh, what sort of decisions can we all be making right now to uh, save us from losing this, to get more of this and get less of what we have when you move inland and off the beach? Well, a couple of things. Built from the bottom up. This was built by local people, uh, the gay community, artists and creatives coming here and renovating what was then a paradise in peril. And then the boom came and then financialization came, and then came all the bad mortgages, and it collapsed. So one of the things that's happening is this is really America 
in miniature. When you go out to those outlining areas, you see poverty, you see despair, you see service jobs or no jobs. You come here, though, and it's really the globalization of Miami Beach. It's not Americans buying. It's Brazilians and other Latins and Canadians and Russians. And while the rest of Florida sinks, Miami Beach becomes becomes uh, to come back. Uh, Omer, uh, we've talked about this in the past. I want to get into it right now. You cannot get where you are going if, A, you don't have a destination, if you do not have a, a set of values to get to that destination, and most importantly, if you do not have an accurate set of gauges to evaluate whether you are getting closer to your goal. Uh, elaborate for us on how we need to act and what that means in our effort to try to get to a destination of true uh, betterness, economics for humans, as you put it. Sure. I think that, you know, part of the problem we have in this country is that we're still uh, competing uh, with an industrial age definition of prosperity. So we built this thing called GDP many, many decades ago. And GDP kind of tells us that we should maximize industrial output, right? Which is kind of just stuff. And so the question for us today, if we want to build better lives, is what does prosperity really mean to us? Is it just about more, bigger, faster, cheaper? Which was kind of one end of the Floridian dream, right? The McMansions and the housing bubble. Or is it very much more about kind of smarter, fitter, closer, the human stuff that tends to make life really good? So we have to make a choice, and that choice is fundamentally, number one, about our values. But number two, what do we do once we craft these values? Can we build better measures of what prosperity is? And I think that's one of the fundamental challenges confronting us today. Don't forget, we're the nation that built GDP. And one of the measures that really has struck me, and we talk about it on the show, we talk about it extensively in the book, Social mobility, that is the American dream, an opportunity for anybody who can create value and and work and collaborate with other people to make them their own lives better and the lives of those around them better. Only 8% of U.S. men in poverty today, 8%, more than 90% of them do not rise to the top 20% uh, of incomes. What does that number tell you? Well, look, we have reached the record low in modern American history since numbers have been tracked of American mobility. The American dream isn't owning a house, which traps you. It's being upwardly and economically mobile. And if that means, like my grandparents coming from Italy to America or coming from wherever you did, you got to be mobile to get it. Now, one of the things that's really interesting that's happening right here in Miami sort of blew me away, Dylan. All of the houses and condos that couldn't be sold, they're sitting there vacant. Sooner or later, they they went, they got new owners, and they turned them into rentals. People started flowing into the city from the suburbs, creating energy in downtown. Now, I'll tell you what's happened right here in this Miami Beach, which is a model for this country of mobility and affordability. The Community Development Corporation in Miami Beach took over some failed condos. They finished them off and they turned them into affordable housing for the service workers who work in this Delano Hotel. What a model. We have a surplus of housing. We have a lot of housing that nobody's using. It's empty. Turn it into affordable housing, encourage mobility back from the suburbs to downtown where the work is, and put people in affordable housing. It gives them a better way of life and achieves that betterness that Umar has been writing about. And how much of a barrier, we have Bo Biden on the show, we've talked about this extensively, how much of a barrier to any form of adaptation or mobility is the big, giant slug of debt (laughs) that lays by $13 trillion across the backs of the American homeowner to achieving any of the things that we talk about, Umer. Listen, it's it's a huge barrier, right? It's a huge barrier. But, but, But the point is that if we are willing to confront these issues, then I think the changes that we need to make are eminently doable. Okay, what does it take to build the kind of... Imagine that we had a better GDP that measures exactly what Richard just talked about, right? This increase in social mobility. What is stopping us from building that? It takes billions to build high-speed train lines, right? It takes billions in stimulus to, to kick off all the stuff that, 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 that the government is talking about. To build these measures and really get serious about changing our values, that's one of the best investments we can make because the returns are huge and the upfront costs are very, very, very low. So I think that's, uh, that's really where we need to begin. I think that challenge is in front of us, and I think we can take it on tomorrow if we want. Uh, how do we... Deliver the message because it's interesting. We've we've only our, this whole 30 million jobs tour has really only begun. We were in Southern California. We are in Northern California. We've we're obviously spent the past few days in South Florida. Uh, we're going to Washington D.C. next week. We'll go to Texas. We're going to continue with this throughout the year. Everybody gets it. Every community you walk into gets it. They understand what Umer is talking about. They understand what you're talking about. They understand what I'm talking about. And yet the message still does not seem to make it into the belly of the beast. How critical is it that we organize in Miami, 
in San Francisco, in Austin, Texas, in Dallas, Texas, and, and how does that organization help us ultimately drive to the federal government? Well, you know you're headed to Washington, and I lived there for four years, and they don't get it. It's brain dead across both parties, but go to any town. Go to Miami Beach, go to Austin, go to Ann Arbor, go to the Rust Belt, the mayors and the communities. And I was just talking to a German reporter from Der Viet. She said she came here expecting despair throughout the land. And of course, our country's been devastated. But what she found in every little hamlet in Berg, not the big cities, she found people rebuilding, people starting coffee shops and cafes, remaking their downtown cores. And I think that's what's really great about America. I call it a great reset. It's not coming from above, Dylan. It's not coming from our government leaders. It's coming from the bottom up. Sometimes I say, and maybe you think it's nuts, what if we let the mayors of this country be in charge for a year? Just give them a year. I'll bet you they could, Republican and Democrat and Independent, they could begin to turn our country around. But it's going to come from the bottom up, not from the top down this time. Omer, you agree with that? I, could, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I say decentralize the idea of these measures. Let every town in the country create their own measure of prosperity. Let it happen from the bottom up. Absolutely. The fundamental barrier to all of this, and we talked about this extensively when we were looking at infrastructure in the Bay Bridge last week in San Francisco. We talked about it uh, in the context of entrepreneurship in the Valley and also with the folks yesterday here with the, at University of Miami and Launchpad. If you do not have a financial system, if you do not have a trade agreement, if you do not have a tax code that encourages the type of investment and all the things we're talking about, is it possible, Richard, to really catalyze? I mean, the, it's, it's one thing to have these oases. We need 30 million jobs. Can you drive the level of investment if you don't tackle our banking system, our trade agreements, and our tax? Well, we lost our way, right, Dylan? We lost our way over the past couple of decades. Instead of being what Americans always been, a building economy, incentives for building companies, for building local economies, for investing in building infrastructure, we became a trading economy. Flip some stocks, flip some houses. So what we have to do is get our incentives right. We have to incentivize building and disincentivize trading. Umar's written all about that on jobs. <laughs> You know, you've been making this case. We need 30 million good jobs. And, and one thing we got to do, you know, we made manufacturing work good work. It was crappy work. And William Blake called them satanic mills. We helped unions organize. We helped workers get a better go. We improved productivity. We got workers involved in innovation. We have 60 million crappy low-wage service jobs, like the people who work in these hotels. we got to make them good jobs. we got to drive those wages up, and we got to create more, just like you're talking yeah, about. That's it. Listen, uh, thank you so much, Richard. Thank uh, you, man. You're a teacher for me, and, uh, and, and I appreciate it. Same for you, Amir. Thank you so much. Thanks for Next having me. Next time, I suspect you'll make the trip. Are you kidding? Look at this. <laughs>